the exciting second version or portion of complex numbers notes. You are going to need to have a firm grasp on the powers of I and how they work to be highly successful with today's stuff. So just recapping, I is the square root of negative one, stands for the imaginary unit. We watched a quick video showing us that they are not made up. They were discovered. We use the symbol I to represent the value of the square root of negative one because, well, our tiny human brains can't comprehend the value of the square root of negative one. So the best thing we could do is give it a symbol. We then said square root of negative one, or excuse me, I squared is the square root of negative one quantity squared. Of course, squares and square roots cancel each other, leaving us with negative one. So if you square I, you get right back to the real number system. I cubed could be broken into I squared times I. We just got the result that I squared was negative one. So this means negative one times I, which is negative I. Remember, I is not a negative number. It is the square root of a negative number, but it itself is not a negative number. And then lastly, I to the fourth could be thought of as saying I squared times I squared, which is negative one times negative one, or back to the realm of the real numbers, positive one. These are the only four quantities that powers of I can take on. Powers of I can be equal to I, negative one, negative I, or one, and that's it. And it works like this, I to the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, so on and so forth, bless you. Essentially, what we're hunting for, which is what you saw here, are exponents that are multiples of four. Because you have I raised to an exponent that is a multiple of four, it will equal one overall. So what you can do is, you can just ask yourself, if I were to have divided by four, what would the remainder have been? And the remaining power, one, two, or three, is what power of I that you're actually working with. And we'll practice that in the notes today, but I wanted to recap this table because it is super important for today's material. If you weren't here yesterday, we'll get it copied at another point in time. I'm going to scoot. Wait, so how do you know that one to the 66? How do I know that uh, one to the 66 power is one? Because one to any power is one. Okay. Here, let's simplify this radical expression. You can multiply any numbers that you would like. Real, non-real, radicals, letters, whatever. Mathematics, you can multiply anything. But before we go multiplying any radicals, we do need to simplify them, especially if they have a negative number inside the as, as the radicand the number underneath the square root bar if it is negative you must reduce this radical before you do any multiplying because we are treating negative one as a perfect square we can ask ourselves what perfect square negative can we divide negative 28 by what negative perfect square goes into 28 negative 28 negative four does you can divide negative 28 by negative four it'll go seven times I'm going to circle the seven because it is prime, therefore it is trapped inside that radical. Then I got times four, and we have to ask ourselves, what perfect square can we divide 18 by? The answer is nine. The two, like I said, prime, therefore trapped. So what we're gonna do in this next step is anything that's not trapped, we're gonna liberate those numbers from our radical. And because everything is held together with multiplication dots inside and outside, everything will still be held together with multiplication dots inside and outside. Yes, David. Nine is the only perfect square that you can divide 18 by. Mm -hmm. One never counts because one goes into everything. So liberating square root of negative four as two I, because the square root of negative one is I and the square root of four is two. We could say the square root of this is I times two or 2i. There's already a 4 on the outside, and liberating the square root of 9 comes out as a 3. Yes, those are all multiplication dots. 7 is stuck inside, 2 is stuck inside. And now all we have to do is multiply. 2 times 4 is 8, 8 times 3 is 24, i comes along for the ride. 7 times 2 is 14. So what you just saw happen here was I multiplied two radicals that still had things underneath them. 
you could say that's one radical with multiplication underneath it. Now, if you have questions about this process anywhere along the way, please say something. Let me help you. What can I do for you? Because there were questions in period one and period two. Yes, Nolan. So two I, two I is actually the product of two different square roots. The square root of negative one, by definition, is I. And the square root of four is two. So this says this is actually liberated as I times two. So we just said two I. Essentially, the square root of, let's say, what's the square root of nine? You know, it's three. So, and the square root of negative one, by definition, is I. So if I say the square root of negative nine, you just say three I. So the I is you handling the square root of essentially the negative symbol. It's the square root of negative one. Yes. So you want to know about where this I sits. This is the easiest thing to say. Technically, it's not correct unless the I is written after the square root bar. But you're never going to see that on one of my tests where I'm like, ha, you didn't put the I behind the radical wrong. You know, I'm not going to do that to you. Okay. And you still don't even know why that's the case because I haven't taught you yet. I just told you that's kind of a rule. You'll see why today. Now, in part B, th yes, no one. This three, that's the square root of this nine coming out. In part B, we have no negative numbers underneath our radicals. That means we don't have to worry about any I's in this one. And we saw the square root of 75 in yesterday's lesson, but 75 is not a perfect square. The biggest perfect square that you can divide 75 by is 25. It goes in three times. I'm going to identify the three as the stuck item. Do you have to do this whole circling thing? No. I'm just doing it to show you because I, it helped when I was an Algebra 1 teacher, so why not do it now in Algebra 2, right? The 3 is already outside, and 8 is also not a perfect square. The only perfect square, other than 1, 1 never counts. The only perfect square that we can divide 8 by is 4. And 4 happens to go in two times. Wait, hold on. What's up? Yes. So the only way that your stuck objects will ever reduce later on is if the stuck stuck objects are the same number. The reason why they're stuck is because they're prime or they are a product of primes. So the only time that something will reduce is if it's a product of primes and something else happens to be a product of primes and they match. For example, six would be a stuck number, right? But if you had a six stuck under, let's say this was a six and not a seven. If this was a six and a two, this would have been a 12, which does reduce. But the reason why is because six has a factor of two. So there would have been a two here and a two here liberating a two. So yes, you do need to watch for it. But if the stuck things are prime, as long as they don't match, no you're fine. If the stuck thing is not prime, then you need to watch out. Okay. Then you would just reduce. Like, let's just say that this said square root of 12 right here. Then you would have said, Oh, that's actually four times three square root of four comes out. Okay. So you would just continue the reducing process until you're stuck. Okay. Yep. Now here, the two is already on the front. The square root of 25 is five. The three is already on the front. The square root of four is two. Inside my radicals, I have a three and a two. They're both prime, so there's nothing that'll happen here. Two times five is 10. Three times two is six. 10 and six makes 60. Root six, and it's finished. You have question face. Oh, it was on your phone, gotcha. Now I want to bring your attention to something. Here, you saw me multiply two radicals and the objects that were stuck inside got multiplied. 
you actually need to reduce, simplify your radicals as much as possible before you want to do this. And the reason why is because you're actually not allowed to multiply these two radicands to each other. I cannot say this is the square root of negative 48 times negative 3. The reason why is because this square root has an imaginary component and this square root also has an imaginary component. When you multiply those two, you're going to have an I squared somewhere, which is negative 1. But if you tried to combine this to one radical and say that this is actually the square root of negative 48 times negative 3, it would be the square root of a positive number. So it's a completely different answer. We have to simplify the individual radicals before we can actually combine them. Yesterday, we talked about the number 48. We said that 16 is a factor of 48. So we're going to say the biggest perfect square that we can divide negative 48 by is negative 16. It will go in three times. And right here, 3 is prime. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to split the negative away from the 3. Like that. We'll say it's negative 1 times 3. We'll identify this 3 is stuck and this 3 is stuck. The square root of 16 is 4, so the square root of negative 16 is 4i. The square root of negative 1, by definition, is also i. And then I have 3 times 3. Yeah. So I now have 4i squared times the square root of 9. Well, i squared is negative 1. And the square root of 9 is 3. So we have 4 times negative 1 times 3, and it gets you negative 12. There you go. Questions, please? I'm sure they're out there. Let's hear them. Yes, sir? So, does it matter if the i gets written behind or in front of the number? Let me ask you a question. What sounds better, 2x or x2? Probably 2x. 2x. Same goes for i. Now, i is not a variable. But i2 or 2i? 2i is easier to say. Especially if you treat i like an object, then you're saying two of those objects. Two i's. Or you can do the same thing with x's. Two x's. So, if it's... You can even do the same thing with square root 3. 5... Square root 3, think of it as saying 5 square root 3s. I have 5 of these objects. So whatever the object is, put its coefficient in front of it. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So if a negative object is square root, yes, if you have it like If you have a negative underneath a square root, no matter what, an i will be on the outside. Okay. Yes. And you can never leave a negative under the square root bar. Yes. There we go. So yeah, if you have a negative under a radical, there's an i. Guaranteed. So like, what's the square root of negative 5? It's i root 5. The negative can't stay in there. These two things multiply to be negative 12. See? Negative 12. Yes, i squared equals negative 1, because i squared is saying square the square root of negative 1. So the square and the square root cancel each other, giving you just negative 1. Yep. Never multiplied by i will only be positive if the exponent is uh, 4 or multiplied. Okay, so let's separate the idea of imaginary and positive negative, because imaginary numbers are not negative numbers. Imaginary numbers are square roots of negative numbers. They themselves don't have sign unless you put a sign in front of them. Like, if I just said 2i, that's a positive 2i. Because there's also a negative 2i. That would just be negative 2 times i. Just like this is just negative i. So i itself is not a negative number. It's the square root of a negative number. 
It's the symbol that we use because we can't comprehend its value in any other way. And you might want to know, well, what is the square root of negative one? And I say, well, the problem is it's not a real number, so you can't describe it using real numbers. You know what I mean? It's kind of like asking someone, well, what color is the wind? Well, that doesn't make any sense. So you can't, what does the square root of negative one equal? It equals I. We don't have a way of explaining it because our number system just lacks the terminology, so to speak. Okay, so here, let's uh, deal with large powers of I. 26 is not a multi... They can hear you guys talking while I'm teaching. You know that on the video? You know that, right? Their microphone is really good at packing, picking up background information. So we can hear everybody talking while I'm teaching. Anyway, 26 is not a multiple of 4. You want multiples of 4. When i's exponent is a multiple of 4, you get the number 1. So 26 is not a multiple of 4. What number that's a little bit smaller than 26 is a multiple of 4? 24. So what we're going to do is instead of saying i to the 26th, we're going to say it's i to the 24th times i squared. You know, when you multiply two numbers at the same base, you add the exponents. You learn that in algebra 1. x times x is x squared because you're adding the exponents. So i to the 24th times i to the 2nd is i to the 26th. But 24 is a multiple of 4. Well, no, it's just it's a multiple of 4. Yes. So this number is actually equal to 1. How come? You can think of it, if you wanted to, as i to the 4th 6 times. Would I ever do it this way? No. How many times is that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Here's the 6th one. There's i to the 24. Would I ever do that? Absolutely not. But here's what we're seeing. Every i to the fourth is equal to one. So this is one times one times one times one times one times one times i squared. And i squared is negative one. I never would have written these out. I would have just said, oh, that's i to the fourth a bunch of times. And i to the fourth is one. And you can multiply 1 to itself as many times as you want. You're always going to get back 1. I squared is negative 1 by definition. Okay? All right. Next. You could reduce the powers of i individually. Or you could go ahead and combine these and then reduce the power of i. Because they're not in radicals, you can do that. It doesn't matter. If they were in radicals, you'd have to reduce first. There's six of these. Because four times six is 24. Because she's counting. It's a good thing she wasn't wearing mittens. It would have slowed her down. Because mittens look like this. Yeah. It's a counting on your fingers joke. Yeah. Anyway. Three times negative two is negative six. And i to the 31st times i to the 5th is i to the 36th. 36 is a multiple of 4. So i to the 36th equals 1. All i to the 4th powers are equal to 1. This is 9 of them. So this is 1 to the 9th power, essentially. So you just get negative 6. I'm showing you that i to the 36 equals 1. Because 3 times... Okay, stop. Too many voices, too many questions at once. 3 times negative 2 is negative 6. i to the 31st times i to the 5th is i to the 36th. 36 is a multiple of 4. It's 9 times 4. So this says i to the 4th written out 9 different times. I'm clearly not going to do that. 
but I know that every time the power of i is a multiple of 4, it equals 1, which is what you see right here. So this is i to the 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, 32, 36, 40, 44, so on and so forth. Okay? Every time the power is a multiple of 4, i equals i to that power equals 1. Okay. Right here, again, order of multiplication doesn't matter. So you might as well combine these. There's the 3 on the front. i to the 1st times i to the 53rd is i to the 54. Now, what's the square root of 64? Lots of people. What's the square root of 64? 8. So what's the square root of negative 64? Negative 8i. The square root of negative 1 is i. So this is 8i. Three times eight is twenty-four, and fifty-four plus one is fifty-five. Fifty-five is not a multiple of four, so we need to know our times tables. What number smaller than fifty-five is a multiple of four? Fifty-two. Forty-eight plus four is fifty-two, so it's fifty-two. Card players know that. Because there's 52 cards in a deck. There's four suits. 13 times 4 is 52. Anyway, 24. I've played cards in my life, yes. 52 times, or 52 plus 3. Because this is a multiple of 4, i to this power is equal to 1. So this whole expression right here is 1. And i cubed is negative i. So this is 24 times negative i, which is negative 24i. Questions on reducing powers of i before we go to the next big concept. Let me grab a piece of scrap paper for this. About to hit you guys with a mind bomb. <clears throat> Ready? Yes. All right. Up until yesterday, you guys were only familiar with one number system. This number system was the real numbers. You don't need to draw this or anything. Just, just watch for a second. The real numbers. This is the only number system that you were familiar with until yesterday. Yesterday I introduced imaginary numbers. Imaginary numbers are not real numbers. Real numbers are not imaginary numbers. They do not overlap. This is a Venn diagram. They don't overlap. They have nothing in common. A complex number is any number that can be written in the form A plus BI, where A is the real component of the complex number. B is the imaginary component of the complex number. This is standard form, and a complex number is technically not correct. It is not finished until it's written in this order. So let me write some complex numbers for you. 2 plus 5i. Its real component is 2. Its imaginary component is 5. Um, negative 3 minus i. Its real component is negative 3. Its imaginary component is negative 1. Okay, so they're complex numbers because they're made up of a real piece and an imaginary piece. You ready for that mind bomb? Yes. Boom. Every number in the universe is a complex number. So every real number is a complex number. 
Let's take the number 2, for example. Let me show you that 2 is a complex number. There, 2 plus 0i, a complex number. Its real component is 2, and its imaginary component is 0. The number i is also a complex number, whose real component is 0, and its imaginary component is 1. So every single number, real or imaginary, is a complex number. Isn't that neato mosquito? Do you remember yesterday, those of you that were here that saw the video, and uh, did we see the part where it mentioned the fundamental theorem of algebra? Uh, yeah, sure. yeah, the fundamental theorem of algebra was that a polynomial of degree n has exactly n solutions. Okay, the actual fundamental theorem of algebra says a polynomial of degree n has exactly n complex solutions, meaning some of them are real numbers, some of them are not real numbers but there's always in solutions. So we say in complex because that encompasses all. Booyah. So first, yes? What exactly is an imaginary number? An imaginary number, since you weren't here for yesterday's lesson, is a two-dimensional number. Your number line is a line, right? Your number line is one-dimensional. So this one-dimensional line's got all the numbers on it that you know and love. Zero, one, two, one-half, uh, negative square root, um, well, it's, well, I don't know, like here, negative square root two. It's got all the numbers, okay? All the numbers, rational and irrational. Imaginary numbers are above and below the real axis. So it's a second dimension to your number. Think of it as an X and a Y. It's not an X and a Y, but treat it that way. It's a two dimensional number. And you know how I just said, treat it like an X and a Y? They can be plotted and graphed in the, imag in the imaginary plane. Yes. There's whole branches of mathematics devoted to it. Yeah, the video you wanna watch it, it's called the uh, Imaginary numbers are real. It's a 13 part a series. The first one has a really neat image, like little imagery that they saw yesterday, where a guy grabs a graph and lifts it up off the paper and turns it into a curved object and the X axis becomes a plane. It's, it's neat, you wanna see it. Okay, so here we go. What we're saying is this complex number on the left is this complex number on the right. We just need to solve for x and y that make that true. If you are not taking notes in color, the little underlines won't make sense to you, so maybe use a box and a circle. I don't know. But I'm using underlines because I'm writing in color. Here's what I see. The real part of the number on the left is 5x minus 7. The real part of the number on the right is 13. So in order for these two complex numbers to be equal, their real components must be equal. That's all I'm doing. Add seven to both sides, and then divide by five. So in order for these two complex numbers to have the same real component, x has to be four. 20 minus seven is 13, perfect. Their real components match. Now we make their imaginary components match. This is actually called equating coefficients. So as long as y plus 4 equals 11, then my imaginary components will match on both sides. Subtract 4 from both sides, you get y equals 7. Now before someone asks, I didn't do anything with i, I didn't get rid of i, what I said was, if I want this imaginary component to match this imaginary component, I need the coefficients to match. So y plus 4 had better be the same as 11. I didn't get rid of i, nothing happened to i. All I'm saying is if x is 4 and y is 7, this left-hand side will say 13 plus 11i. That's it. Okay? Not bad, right? For that one, yeah, it just says find x and y that make this equation true. There it is. Now it's true. Now this equating coefficients thing, 
is a very valuable skill that works into very into higher mathematics as well. Not always just with imaginaries. It's called equating coefficients, where if you've got some stuff on the left and some stuff on the right, and you go, oh, but the both the left and the right, they both have an x to the third on them or something like that, then I know their coefficients better be equal. So it's called equating coefficients. Same, same trick here. Yes? Because this has no eyes, that makes this all real stuff. Okay? So if it doesn't have eyes, that's the real stuff. Right here, 2x and 8, no eyes. That then is the real stuff. 2x plus 8 has to equal 2. Subtract 8 from both sides and divide both sides by 2. If x equals negative 3, then the real component of my left-hand number is 2, which is what I needed. Now, the imaginary component. On the left, the imaginary component is y plus 11. On the right, the imaginary component is negative 4. Subtract 11 from both sides, and you get here. There. If x is negative 3 and y is negative 15, my left-hand complex number is 2 minus 4i. Just making a match. No big deal. Complex numbers are numbers. That means you can do anything with them that you could do with other numbers. Add, subtract, multiply, divide, powers, roots, you name it. Why does what work? I'm just saying this number is this number. Yeah. So the real parts have to match. The complex parts or the imaginary parts have to match. Yeah, but does that always work? It's called equating coefficients. It always works if two sides of an equal sign. That equals means everything on the left is identical to everything on the right. That's what equals means. Mm -hmm. um, This is what I was saying. Nothing happened to I. What I said was, this has to be equal to this. Here, let's say I wrote this. Let me ask you a question. If 5x equals m times x, what is m equal? See how x m has to be 5? See how you didn't care about the x? You were just making sure that the numbers in front matched? That's all we're doing here. We're making sure the number in front of I matches. This is subtraction. It's one complex number minus another. Hardest part about this one is, remember, that that's actually minus both objects. 8 plus 3I minus 4 minus negative 10I. It's just subtraction. Minus the 4 and minus the negative 10I. So 8 plus 3i minus 4 plus 10i, and you just combine your like terms. 8 minus 4 is 4. 3i plus 10i is 13i. Finished. It's just combining like terms. That's all it is. Yes. It was this thing at the top of the page that he introduced. You must have been ignoring me when I was teaching that. It just means that the real part gets written and then the imaginary part. Okay. <clears throat> I strongly suggest that you reduce this power of I before you distribute. 3I to the fifth. Remember, 5 is not a power, excuse me, 5 is not a multiple of 4. You want the powers to be multiples of 4 with leftovers. Say i to the 5th is actually i to the 4th times i. Because i to the 4th equals 1. This is actually just 3i. I'm going to rewrite this in black. But instead of saying 3i to the 5th, I'm just going to say 3i. Now you just distribute, combine like terms, and reduce powers of i if they happened again. 
2 times negative 1 gives me negative 2. 2 times 2i gives me 4i. Positive 3i times 2 gives me positive 6i. Positive 3i times i gives me positive 3i squared. Oh, oh, wait a minute. But what is i squared again? i squared is negative 1. So 3i squared is actually 3 times negative 1, so it's actually just negative 3. This number is negative 3. Combining my like terms then, negative 2 and negative 3 make negative 5. And 4i plus 6i is 10i. That's it. This, this is this. Yes, David. I'm so confused where you put the three, where you put the five on top of the three i. Three i to the fifth is three i to the fourth times i. i to the fourth is one. Three times one is three. Three times i is three i. So I replaced three i to the fifth with three i because I simplified it. Okay. Just like right here, I simplified three times negative one to be negative three. Yes. I squared is negative 1. Okay. Flip it over. That was adding and subtracting. Now we're going to multiply. How do you think we're going to multiply these two complex num numbers? Distribution. But when it's two binomials like this, the trick that you were taught for that distribution process is foiling foil you remember that two times four two times negative i three i times four three i times negative i But since i squared is negative 1, that says negative 3 times negative 1. So you get positive 3. Then you just combine your like terms. 8 plus 3 is 11. Negative 2i plus 12i is 10i. It's literally just foiling, distribution, combining like terms, reducing powers of i. Now, speaking of reducing powers of i, you could multiply first, you know, foil first, or reduce first. The only place where you must reduce first is if you're dealing with square roots of negative numbers. That's the only time you must reduce first. I do not want to distribute this i cubed. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to simplify 4i cubed before I do any distribution. What am I doing? i cubed, i cubed is negative i. So this is just 4 times negative i, which is negative 4i. Rewrite this then as negative 1 plus 2i times 2 minus 4i. Now it's exactly like the one that we did above it. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. Negative 1 times negative 4i is positive 4i. 2i times 2i, it's going to be 2i times 2 is 4i again. And 2i times negative 4i is negative 8i squared. But because i squared is negative 1, negative 8i squared is actually equal to positive 8. Then you just combine your like terms. Negative 2 and 8 add to 6. 4i and 4i add to 8i. 
And that will do it for us nerds. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Any questions before I stop the video? Because questions are always good to put in the video. You're asking me a homework question. Okay, any questions about this one? No? All right. Cool beans.